So good evening, everyone, to all the participants and welcome to today's talk on striking fair deals for equitable access to medicines. Uh, this uh, talk is uh, co-organized by TechX Venture Center and DNDI. So what we will do is in the first five minutes, I will just introduce you to Venture Center, what are its activities, what is TechX.in and what is DNDI. Then I will formally introduce both the speakers for today's talk and then we will hand it over to our speakers. Next slide, please. So uh, Venture Center, uh, this is an incubation center which is situated at the NCL campus. Next slide, please. Venture Center, this is a leading inventive enterprise incubator and we are a section eight not-for-profit incorporated as entrepreneurship development center. We started operations in January, 2007 and we are the first incubator in the CSIR uh, family. And this incubator is being hosted by CSR NCL and we have been approved by NSTDB and Virac Government of India. Uh, so uh, it's it feels very nice to uh, show you know that a venture center has been uploaded with many of uh, the uh, many of the awards a few have been displayed here and the recent one was uh, the best incubator for nurturing ip award which was received recently in 2022 next slide please so uh, what is the purpose and focus areas of Venture Center? Uh, the purpose of Venture Center is to nucleate and nurture wo uh, world's leading inventive ven uh, ventures, which are emerging out of India that solve the world's most pressing problems with science and technology led uh, inventions. And our focus areas are uh, mainly on inventive enterprises and spin-offs from R&D organizations. Uh, we are sector agnostic, but our strengths lie in science-based technology. So uh, below you can see these are the four areas in which we uh, focus on is, is health and rehabilitation, energy and environment, engineering and automation, agriculture and nutrition. Uh, these are a few emerging sectors where Venture Center is developing its pipeline on. Uh, circular economy, biopharma, advanced medical biotechnology, digital IT uh, sensors and electronic variables. Uh, in the defense uh, domain, climate and action, energy management and food security. So these will be the upcoming sectors where uh, we plan to expand our activities. Next slide, please. Uh, so Venture Center can be said this is a complete ecosystem where we uh, support uh, right from mentoring, funding, infrastructure facilities to information and partnerships. Below you can see the support, uh, in uh, the support that's provided by Venture Center, which is for uh, prototyping, testing, regulatory, tech and transfer related, uh, tech transfer and IP related activities. Uh, so uh, TechX.in, which is one of the co-organizers of today's event, uh, runs this vertical. Next slide, please. So in short, uh, Venture Center provides a comprehensive support to promote early stage ideas, startups, and entrepreneurs through its diverse and impactful ecosystem. Next slide, please. Uh, so this was a very, very brief overview about what is Venture Center and uh, what are uh, what are its activities. If we, uh, if anyone is interested to know further, they can please visit our website, venture, venturecenter.co.in. And if uh, you can also write to manager incubator at venturecenter.co.in for further information. Uh, now I will just give you a brief overview of what is techx.in. Uh, this is uh, a tech transfer hub at Venture Center, which has been supported by NPM and BIRAC. TechX.in, this is an regional tech transfer office, which has been designated uh, by BIRAC, Government of India, and we have been supported by the National Biopharma Mission. The aim of uh, TechX.in is to support tech commercialization journey. So we facilitate exchange and transactions related to any science or engineering based technological ideas. Uh, to accomplish uh, this aim or, you know, uh, we have a certain services that we have launched under the TechX.in uh, uh, vertical. They have been covered as tech commercialization, policy, IP, protection and decision support and industry academia partnering. Uh, each of this uh, vertical or each of this service gives uh, you different aspects related to tech, related, uh, tech transfer related activities. These are our coordinates for techx.in. You can write to TTO at venturecenter.co.in. You can also visit uh, www.techx.in for further information related to our services. Now about our uh, next uh, co-organizer, co that is DNDI. 
DNDI, uh, this is a drugs for neglected disease in initiative. This is also a not-for-profit medical research organization that discovers, develops, and delivers safe, effective, and affordable treatments for neglected people. DNDI is developing medicines for mysotoma, dengue, pediatric HIV, which uh, and you know more have been listed here. Their research priorities include children's health, gender equity, gender responsive, and R&D, and disease impacted by climate change. Since its creation in 2003, DNDI has joined with public and private sector uh, partners across the globe to deliver 13 new treatments which have helped in saving millions of lives. More about DNDI, you can go and visit their website, dndi.org. Slide, please. Yeah. So I will quickly give a brief introduction to the speakers today. Today we have with us uh, Pascal Bollett. So welcome, uh, Ms. Bollett. And uh, she has a brief about her uh, portfolio. Mr. Ms. Bollett joined DNDI in November 2008 as intellectual property and policy advisor. And she acted as a head of policy affairs in 2012-2013. In 2017, she became the intellectual property and access leader with DNDI legal team. Ms. Bollett, she's a lawyer by experience of 25 years in intellectual property laws and policies with a particular focus in public interest licensing and access to essential medicines. Prior to joining DNDI, Ms. Bollett acted as a senior legal advisor of MSF Access Campaign and technical officer with WHO Medicines Department. Besides her part-time work with DNDI, Ms. Bollett works as an independent consultant with various public health organizations. Welcome, Ms. Bollett. Uh, our second speaker for today is Dr. Kavita Singh. So Dr. Kavita Singh is presently the director of South Asia for Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative, which is a drug R&D organization. Her career has been at the interface of clinical research, public health, and advancements of innovations for delivery. She has worked with pharma industry, government, and non-profit organizations. Dr. Singh served as a mission director, National Biopharma Mission BIRAC. She was also the program director of Multiple Vaccine Development Program, a not-for-profit scientific research society, which has been, was established by DUM, the Department of Biotechnology. And Dr. Singh worked as a director of business development at Fortis Clinical Research Limited Group, as a leader of uh, medical affairs and clinical research at Ranbaxi Laboratories, and also as the head medical affairs at Shanta Bioethnics Private Limited, which is uh, now called as the Sanofi Healthcare Private India Limited. She is a trained physician with a MD in microbiology. She has also completed a postgraduate diploma in epidemiology. And Dr. Singh is a life member of Indian Association of Medical Microbiologists and Indian Society of Clinical Research. So uh, with this brief introduction to Venture Center, to DNDI and TechX and as our speakers today, I would like to uh, request both the speakers to kindly uh, take over the session from here. Sorry, uh, can I... Yes, sir. Yes, interrupt sir. a few minutes in the meantime. Kavita, are you able to unmute? Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, yes. sorry. Yeah. I got that wrong. Uh, yeah, okay, great. So first of all, uh, thank you very much for that introduction, uh, Vidula. I just wanted to just put in a couple of words. Very happy to have Dr. Kavita Singh here today. Um, the TechX program got started during her tenure um, as mission director of... Uh, um, um, uh, NBM, uh, and that was actually some of the things which uh, uh, the, the thinking behind it and conceptualizing it and rolling it out nationally as a network of tech transfer offices, uh, the credit goes to her and her team, uh, which made it possible. Uh, and we're happy that we are serving a useful purpose today <laughs> on very close to the World IP Day on something of very uh, great importance, uh, which is affordable medicines. Uh, for the uh, for the world, um, uh, I'm also uh, uh, grateful to Pascal for agreeing uh, to speak uh, today. Uh, I saw the publication when it came out, and I I knew that I should be asking you to speak uh, immediately. Uh, but it took us some time to get there. But nonetheless, it's a important, uh, a very important part of. Um, you know, the journey to make medicines affordable and available to all. And I think uh, we appreciate your initiatives and the perspectives that the NDI is bringing to this. Hopefully, many more people will adopt some of the policies and the frameworks that you have suggested 
uh, can be used in future programs as well. Uh, I think Pascal, you should tell us uh, how to correctly pronounce your last name because I, I'm almost sure Vidula made a mistake there. <laughs> no worries. Bullet. You can say bullet. <laughs> okay, bullet. <laughs> okay. So uh, over to you, Kavita. I think I'll request you to first, uh, um, yeah. you know, open with an introduction to some of the things that um, the NDI is doing and also. Uh, uh, that's happening in South Asia and in India. And from there, I think we can uh, then move on to uh, Pascal and request her to speak uh, about uh, some of these policies which they've suggested and the frameworks which are being incorporated in agreements as well. So over to you, Kavita. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, Prima, just let me know when this screen is visible and it's on a slideshow mode also. Yes, uh, it is visible now. It is not on a slide, a full screen yet. Do we have it now? No, it's not full screen though. Um, okay, let me try again because in my screen it's showing as, uh, let me try again, no worries. Yeah. Give me a second. Just, uh, let's see. yeah, now it's good. Perfect. Yes. So firstly, great. thank you so much. Thank you for this lovely introduction and the kind reminder of the days gone by. And it's honestly it's such a matter of pride to see uh, TechEx doing what it's doing in the ecosystem, uh, you know, diverging and growing every day. So all the best as you still go ahead. And I'm also very thankful to my colleague Pascal for agreeing. I know she has extremely terribly busy schedule, but when we requested her that the Indian ecosystem would love to hear from her. So thank you, Pascal, for making time for all of us here. And I'm sure if we don't, the people are not there, they would love to hear you on the as we have this recording somewhere in, in the YouTube or some other place. So uh, I also thought it's not though it's not right to speak in front of uh, you know Pascal before her because I'm not really an IP expert, but it would be for uh, her content to be you know very easily digestible by the audience. It would be very important to understand how DNDI functions, uh, you know what sort of partnerships, how it moves because. If we hear about it, it goes from discovery to access. So I thought we'll just give you a brief insight into its various mechanisms of working, functioning, so that what Pascal then comes out as policies, you know, that's like the software which runs the organization becomes more, uh, it becomes more clearer to you, all of you. And even before I, you know, deep dive into DNDI, maybe really talk about this genre or this fraternity of organizations, which are called as product development partnerships. And uh, as you would see, as you know, I place a lot of logos in the slide, in the bottom of the slide, um, some are for TB Alliance, some are for diagnostics, some for microbiocides, some are for, um, you know, interna the AIDS vaccine initiatives, or as such medicines for global health or medicines for malaria. Now these, they, uh, many of them have a common principle of functioning. And that is, it is, they act as an aggregator for uh, make, ensuring that the public, private, academia, researchers, philanthropic, governments, they can sort of um, pool in their resources, they pool in their expertise, pool in their domain knowledge for products which you are sure would never catch the interest of commercial organizations. And for reasons rightly, not for any reasons wrongly, but for very right reasons, these are the uh, diseases which impact the population who would not be able to afford these drugs or these vaccines or these preventive measures. So it means there has to be an alternative mechanism of still doing science for make, ensuring these products are available. And in fact, there are quite a few success stories which have saved millions of lives. And from our own organization, we talk about the sleeping sickness, uh, which was practically a disease which we thought we would never be able to, you know, people will continue to die. And today we can talk about uh, its strategy for elimination. So that was the magic of vaccinidazole when DNDI worked with Sanofi. Similarly for Vivax malaria or for you know the most resistant form of uh, drug resist of uh, tuberculosis. So DNDI also in fact was formed exactly 21 years ago uh, with a very similar mandate when you realize in the clinicians treating the patients in the uh, areas where these neglected patients reside and realizing facts that drugs are not available and neither are they being seen in the pipeline of the drugs which are being developed. 
So therefore, you know, when you have these clinicians frustrated and you have patients frustrated and you have the communities frustrated, uh, they say that God always finds a mechanism of doing it. And in 1999, our, uh, our founder our parent, I can say, MSF, got the Nobel Peace Prize and they uh, parked a part of that prize money to create this organization. You know, it was like a testing organization for neglected diseases. But what was really excellent about it is, is that the regions where these diseases are seen in maximum numbers, which is India, uh, Kenya, uh, Brazil, so basically representing continents, big Africa, Latin America, India in the big South Asia region and Ministry of Malaysian Health, they all came together. And with, of course, like I said, with money, uh, start seed money coming in from MSF and even the WHO special program for research and training in tropical diseases. Was, an, uh, was a guiding force for, uh, for establishing this organization. And if you would see this uh, you know, portfolio today, and if you see it starts from discovery, translational development, implementation, uh, I've come from the pharma industry for many years, and you will see it mimics what a pharma industry's portfolio looks like. But instead, the only thing difference, perhaps you would see instead of saying commercialized, the word we use is treatment access. It means how many, how many such treatments are available to patients. But what you also would like to appreciate is these on the, you know, on a Y column is these first column itself is the diseases which we work in and some of them Ridula did mention in her introduction. And each of them, either they are very heavy on discovery, but some are not. So again, sending a message that despite these diseases, it's not that they are very heavily populated with discovery because this is a slow process. But uh, like every organization, we're also proud when we present this uh, achievement of uh, reaching out to so many people on different disease entities. Um, and we talk about, we're talking about malaria here, talking about leishmaniasis, huge work done in India and leishmaniasis, sleeping sickness, um, shagas, and of course, you know, we'll, you would see some pediatric, pediatric dosages also. But how do, you know how do, how is it it's done? Why do I say that it is different from any pharma company? I think I should exp we should explain that to you too, and that is because uh, this organization actually works as a uh, you know it's an orchestra mechanism. And when you say orchestra, it means you're not really yourself playing the music, but you are ensuring every partner who is required in the drug discovery development process is your partner. And it starts either from the academia. Of course, it would need a pharma always need a pharmaceutical industry. And access is never possible till you have the federal or the central health ministries involved. You would never be able to reach the patient population if you're not working closely with the patients and communities. And there has to be a mechanism that either the treatment or the you know test and treat, or because you need to be diagnosed to be treated. So it's a it's a complete world in itself. And the NDI in the center, without having its own uh, manufacturing facilities, without having its own research labs without having its own uh, you know, people working in the um, different areas, but having a central team, which ensures it has a technical expertise to be able to work with such uh, you know, domains, which are very rich and very niche in their area. But while I also try, I want the message I want to pass on through you know, this present um, picture here is that whether a drug R&D is done in a for-profit sector or it's done in a not-for-profit sector, the process is the same. The failure rate is same. The attrition is same. The mechanisms, the uh, the you know the nuances which any drug discovery development process cannot be bypassed or cannot be shortened. And that's what uh, even for not for profit sector development for such diseases remains the same. You know there is no difference there. Except you would always see a difference here in the last end point, the last goal when the drug is available. It's available. Maybe not through the commercial market, maybe through a pooled procurement or maybe through other mechanisms of government procurement or philanthropic donors, you know, they could be or large company donors. That difference could, of course, be there. And um, and like, you know, the other point to understand, because this is very critical for you to understand at this point, because Pascal will make a lot of you know relevance and sense to this, that it is very much possible that our partners are at different stages of development. So whether we are at the discovery phase or the translational development or access phase, our partners could change. They could be same, but they could change too. So it is very important that at each stage, whatever decision we take is favorable and facilitatory to the next stage. 
you know, just reminding that uh, you have to live with what you do in the past. So your past, like this, say the past continues to haunt you in the future, uh, or the past continues to be favorable for you in the future. So a very uh, similar thing, whatever we do, whatever policy or whatever conversation, whatever agreements, whatever commitments, terms, conditions are formed at each stage would guide, would ensure whether or not your drug is accessible and affordable to the consumer, to the patient who needs it the most. And this is what Pascal is going to explain. And that's the reason it was important that I speak before Pascal, though it's not my area. And just to conclude, you know, last couple of slides and maybe uh, uh, that many a times it is, it is always, you know, imagined that industry is a different uh, being in itself, which is right. And the PDPs, researchers are different altogether. But honestly, there is always a, a path or which will intersect between these two types of, uh, with the with same type of work they do, but of course, with the different endpoints in the mind. So, so find that, find that bridging, find that bridge is important. Uh, I will not go into the detail of this, uh, and I would like to have Pascal get more time to talk. But in the end, you could always have some uh, some satisfaction for the people um, who make this pool of uh, academicians, researchers, ensuring treatments, while industrial partner having their own uh, endpoints, their own goals, they're also, uh, they also are fulfilled. But somewhere we find, you know, that what is it that each of them get? Maybe the industrial partner, what it gets, it gets access to new chemical entities uh, without really trying to, in licensing them, where uh, without really trying to have a lot of royalties, uh, but they bring a lot of strengths of distribution, manufacturing, scale up, regulatory. While in the donor researcher, you bring a lot of science. You bring a lot of deep science, years of science. Uh, you bring in the uh, the goodwill of the donor. You bring in networks. You bring in experts. So you de-risk development, and that and this summation, this summation together, allows each entity to get what they want in the end but also makes a viable business case and viable innovation capacities, capabilities developing. And every product really keeps adding on to this. Uh, just one very extra, extremely interesting example, uh, which was for a learning for me too, when I joined the India, was this very early stage collaborations of NTD. We call it the drug discovery booster. So what DNDI, so you would see these all are all, you know, large pharma companies. And DNDI provides to them an active seed compound. And uh, all these companies under their you know, goodwill gestures or other, other uh, different programs, they conduct a simultaneous multilateral you know, search in their own compound libraries. And any learning then sort of uh, iterates back into the process. And of course, since parasitic activity is a big one, so uh, all the compounds which looked good enough were tested for further anti-parasitic activity. But the difference here was that the agreements, the publications uh, were filed instead of the patent and the royalty free lines, licenses were granted to DNDI uh, for use in entities. So what it does is it, of course, it avoids duplication at the same time. Uh, it's, it is uh, iterative and it speeds up the process. So, you know, that's, that's one of the unique mechanism. I thought it was, you might find it very interesting to hear. And, um, so over the years, just to sort of uh, you know come to a conclusion that the discovery group has screened more than 4 million compounds. There's some optimization consortium over the past 20, 21 years, DNDI has formed, knowing that we would need pharmaceutical partners. So today we have more than 20 projects in our DND portfolio, uh, developing new NCEs, and of course, sometimes developing uh, new formulations or new combinations. Just before I conclude, wanted to show that, yes, we uh, in India, we have been there for the last 20 years. And if you would see that we have huge, so many numbers of so many partners in the region, uh, that's actually within the country, partners for us who partner institutes, which partner with us for discovery, for access, for our clinical trials. There is an active phase uh, two clinical trial ongoing of NCE uh, in the state of Bihar. Uh, it will help us in registration, preclinical, then these are the these are the type of diseases we work with in uh, in the region. Presently, working with leishmania, lymphatic paralysis, uh, starting work in mycetoma, dengue, uh, pediatric HIV. So these are the types of naturally because the type of work we do, as we said, the type of partners we have, right from the research to government to foundations, and 
you would uh, maybe I really would like to uh, in the end for me, which was very important, you will see there's a lot of in kind contribution. So it means we have been able to align uh, with the um, objectives and goals of many organizations. So, so, so many of them partner with us. We, of course, do a uh, lot of co applicants. We do apply to national or international grants together as uh, two organizations. So that gives an opportunity for us to partner with many institutes uh, and collaborators. Uh, with that, I think we'll uh, just wrap up saying that a development of any therapeutics requires alliances, huge alliances, especially if you're working in a not-for-profit sector, you don't bring in the heavy muscle or the deep pockets which a pharma company has. Uh, it's ideal to leverage existing R&D networks rather than creating every time new one. And the bottom line message, which I'm sure will be so clear after Pascal talks is, how do we prioritize access from the outset of R&D? And you know, not start talking about it after the drug is available. So commitment with very specific agreements, with openness, with transparency, faith, that we are all on the common objective uh, could be the mechanisms of very successful partnerships in the whole value chain of drug discovery, development, and access. And once again, I thank, uh, thank you all for your patience and for giving me this opportunity to share. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I think um, uh, this, is, this was a very good introduction because then we could uh, set up the stage for Pascal. So over to Pascal. Pascal, it's yours. Uh, floor is yours. We'd like to hear the, more about the policies uh, and uh, you know how uh, also some case studies where it has worked as well. Thank you very much, Premnat. And thank you again for the, this very nice invitation and the opportunity to present this publication. We, we made, uh, we did uh, last year actually, where we, we tried to, <clears throat> to uh, tell the story of the NDI um, negotiating various agreements with various types of partners over the past 20 years. I will try to share some slides, <clears throat> just as, for some reason, I don't see, um, yeah, share screen, sorry. Can you see it? Yeah, it's come up, I can go full screen. And in slideshow, yes. that works too. It's fine, you can see it well, yeah. Perfect. So, um, yes. So I, I I had actually planned to to start uh, exactly where Kavita Kavita stopped with the fact. Just wanting to highlight that um, the commitment to equitable access starts really at the conception of every DNDI pro project, and and is not uh, is not something we consider at the end when the when the development has has terminated. Um, access and the fact that access is is really not only targeted in contract but very much embedded in in all R and D in 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 the whole strategy of that the NDI puts in place with its partners with its partners, starting with the the design of target product profiles, which are the you know the ideal characteristics of the product that are needed to address uh, the neglected uh, disease we are we are targeting. Uh, but also in the selection of partners where we, we very much make sure when we engage into discussion, when, when we start a, a negotiation with a partner, we spend a lot of time to make sure that we have a shared vision uh, towards the, the fact that the end goal is to deliver treatments that will be av available and accessible for neglected patients. Um, the, I will start by by sharing a few years, a few words about the NDI IP policy, because the DNDI intellectual property policy has actually has really been a, um, a key building block of the NDI strategy to address uh, IP. Um, it is based on two, three fundamental principles: the, the the objective to ensure equitable access and affordability of end product, and I will I will provide you more details on this. But as, but as much important is the, the, this objective to, to make the result of the NDI research available 
And by result, we means any data, any knowledge that the NDI will have developed should be made available to the wider research community to so that uh, in particular, because the community working on neglected disease is so small that it, we felt it was really important that all of the knowledge generated by the NDI is, it can be shared. And so uh, a funding principle uh, that, um, that underlines those two principles is the fact that whenever possible, we always try to deliver drugs as public good. However, the terms, uh, the terms and condition of, um, so, sorry. Um, so the DNDIIP policy is very clear that the terms and condition of the NDI agreement shall make sure that the NDI partners cannot use IP to impede access to products or to impede follow-on research by third parties. And But however, the IP ownership licensing and the specific uh, terms of each uh, agreement is of course um, very much negotiated on a case-by-case -case basis and will vary depending on the on each uh, uh, negotiation in place. A few more words on the DNDIIP policy. Uh, I said it was a fundamental pillar of DNDI, um, DNDI strategy. It, it was actually the first policy that DNDI adopted uh, only one year after it was created because, because the DNDI board at the time felt that it would, that the organization needed to have very clear goal, goals and objective um, on, on the best way to manage intellectual property to ensure access. So the IP policy very much reflects the NDI vision and mission. And it, uh, it, it, it states, for example, the fact that uh, the NDI should always negotiate the best possible condition for neglected patients. The fact that any IP generated by the NDI sponsored research project should be used to achieve the NDI mission. So IP is, re is very much perceived as a tool for the NDI and not an, uh, certainly not an end in itself. And that the NDI should always make sure to, to have full freedom to operate through, the, in, uh, through the, the provision of the various agreements we sign to ensure that the, that the research, um, that the NDI is not hampered in taking further any research it has started uh, with the contribution of donor, uh, of donor funding. Um, however, importantly, the NDI activities are not financed by IP revenues. We have a very, uh, again, we have a very specific, very um, quite unconventional approach to IP in the sense that uh, IP is usually used to generate profits. That's not how the NDI uses IP. We use it as a tool to support and strengthen our collaboration. So, uh, we will not sign uh, any partnership without having overcome um, an IP barrier. And we would always um, manage IP in a way to, um, um, in the most affordable and less costly approach and, and as restrictive, as less, rest, as little restrictive as possible. Um, the end, the, the, as I mentioned earlier, a fundamental objective of our uh, collaboration is to ensure that the results of the NDI work are placed in the public domain and remain so. And lastly, we would also, through our approach, and it's part of my contribution today, we help to, uh, to contribute and share our thinking and, and uh, approach on, on innovative approach to um, to manage IP that are aimed at serving the public good. So um, maybe a little more intro and further to the, the, um, the presentation that was made by Kavita, I want to stress the fact that the terms and condition of the NDI license agreement actually very much reflect the characteristics of, of the NDI products, which are developed in partnership as, as, exp as explained uh, in detail to you before. And so the NDI absolutely needs sub-licensable rights. We, every time we, um, we are granted some rights, we need, we need to be able to sub-license and to share further those rights with all, our, uh, all the partners we work with. Uh, but, but our deals also ref uh, reflect the fact that, reflect the little commercial value of neglected disease products. Uh, neglected disease affects patients that are uh, in most most of the times 
um, rather very poor and that that have very little access to uh, to health systems. And so we are always trying to um, to to secure the lowest possible price to those products to ensure that the health systems or the patient themselves can afford the product. Similarly, uh, the NDI products are mainly distributed through the public sector, and this will be reflected in our agreement. However, the agreement will very much will also vary, of course, depending whether depending on whether the, the molecules we work we work on are available in the public domain already or are privately owned. Uh, but also de very much depending on the level of contribution, the level of support uh, provided by the NDI on the one side and by the, dif the various partners on the, on the other side. Um, the stage of development of the project, at which time the partnership starts, will also very much impact the design of the collaboration. And, and the number of increasing number of donor requirements will also very much help design the best possible conditions. Um, of this agreement. So there are uh, four types of terms and conditions I would like to, uh, to focus today, which, which are really important altogether to ensure equitable access to neglected patients and to support the development of product as, as, as public goods. The partner's commitment to affordable and equitable access, which will be, uh, which, which will be um, detailed in the agreement, the publication of the research data, how is IP ownership and licensing of rights um, devised in the agreement, and finally, how rights should survive um, the, expi the expiration or the early termination of the, of the partnership. So to start with the commitment to affordable and equitable access, um, affordability, as I mentioned, is really a key objective of any DNDI partnership, um, which is very much linked again to the to the fact that, uh, that neglected disease affect patients that have a very little uh, purchasing power. Um, and so affordability would always be um, be included and defined in any uh, collaboration and licensing agreement, even if it's an early stage license agreement. Affordability, over the years, we have uh, refined the definition of affordability. And today, um, we, it is defined as the pricing of the product at the lowest sustainable level. That includes only the full production cost as optimized without compromising the quality of the product, direct distribution cost, and a reasonable margin, margin to ensure manufacturing and distribution of the product on a sustainable basis. The, um, the, in case where the, the agreement uh, is uh, is related to a later stage development, in that case, in, in that case we, we would even go further in the definition of affordability and could include uh, a selling uh, a maximum price uh, that the project uh, could, could have or um, a specific uh, maximum margin, reasonable margin that the manufacturer could could um, could then add on the the production and distribution cost, and um, as well as as some details of of what what are the what is entailed into in the in the production cost and distribution cost. The license territory uh, would always aim to include all neglected patients wherever they may live, meaning uh, in the license territory would cover all endemic countries as defined by the WHO. Those, the, those, the, the, the epidemiology might vary over time. And so we would always refer to the WHO definition of, on where, uh, where a disease is endemic or not. But this would, also, this would include not only low, low or middle income countries, but even sometimes high income countries in case um, in case some patients are affected by a neglected disease in, in, in such countries. And finally, to ensure that, um, that, um, that the terms of, of the agreement between DNDI and the partner are respected, DNDI would always have a right to audit the partner's implementation of the pricing, of the, pri the affordable pricing. I referred earlier to the fact that uh, a major objective of the NDI is to, 
to develop treatment as public good whenever possible. This is very much uh, linked to the to our um, uh, clear commitment to ensure timely and open access publication of any uh, DNDI research results. But where in cases where the, the molecule or the compound is, is publicly available, in case where we don't, where the project is not um, is, is based on a molecule that is available in the public domain, we would in, in that case um, aim to um, to conduct the project with such uh, uh, public good and behavior. And so we would include in our agreement a public domain clause that not only ensures the release of the new data generated in the partnership, but also ensures that uh, that um, such data and such knowledge and any intellectual property generated in the partnership would be free of IP rights. And so the parties would specifically agree not to seek to get any protection or claim any registered or unregistered IP rights pertaining, pertaining to the results, including without limitation, patents, trade secrets, or copyright relating thereto. Um, Kavita has, has provided, has mentioned uh, the case of the drug discovery booster that was um, launched, uh, I think about 10 years ago, where where the, the various partners that worked in this early stage discovery consortium all commit agreed that any resulting molecule from this early discovery uh, early discovery consortium would be would be uh, would not be filed for patent protection and and each of the of the partners that um, that are part of this consortium also agreed to give to provide non exclusive rights to the NDI. For the for the purpose of further developing those compounds for the, the neglected disease. So a second very crucial element to ensure access and uh, and facilitate the sharing of research is how the IP uh, pre-existing IP or new newly generated IP within the partnership will be managed. The first thing is to ensure. The so first thing is that. Uh, each of the partners in, uh, would agree to share its background IP. By background IP, we mean any necessary or useful confidential information, data, or patents that is owned by each of the partners and pre this pre-existing to the collaboration or that is owned outside the collaboration but could still be useful for the, for the purpose of the project. So each partner would agree to share this, this background IP with the other partner. And, and we do this through, usually through non-exclusive sublicensable rights in the field, for example, in the, uh, for, for the purpose of developing a treatment for leishmaniasis, and in the, in the territory covering the, all of the endemic countries, as I mentioned earlier. The more, the more difficult negotiations uh, are related to the management and the ownership of collaboration IP, which is the all the IP in the name of know-how data or patents that will be developed through the collaboration. And here we also aim at uh, having um, um, uh, a very uh, a sharing of such IP, uh, either the, the, the party that has developed and, the, and funded such collaboration IP will own it or it will be jointly owned if it has been uh, jointly developed. But in any case, each of the, each of the party will share um, its ownership rights uh, through cross-licensing uh, cross rights with the other party. So that there is, there is again, um, no hurdle in the use and, uh, and in the control of the IP for the purpose of developing the, the treatment for neglected patients. Lastly, the... Um, there are questions also in relation to the, the ownership of the regulatory dossier, which will uh, facilitate, which will uh, enable the market authorization and the commercialization of the of the treatment developed. In general, this dossier will be owned by the partner that owns the market authorization, and so uh, very often this is the case of the industrial partner, the manufacturer of the treatment developed in collaboration with the NDI. But, but such we would request such partner as the NDI to waive any regulatory or market exclusivity, again, always within this period of, of sharing 
and of avoiding any any um, downside or uh, abusive use of exclusivity, which is not necessary in the case of neglected patients or neglected disease, because in fact, there, because such disease cannot uh, generate no profit, no um, no huge margin can be expected for the manufacturer for the from the marketing of those diseases. And the most important is to ensure that they are available and accessible to the patient that needs them. Over the years, um, this the NDI has defined what it call it calls uh, what um, gold standard licensing terms, and those terms again are. Um, uh, included in the agreement in addition to the management of uh, IP generated and the the various characteristic of those licensing terms is that we would we would always aim to have perpetual royalty non-exclusive sub licensable lic uh, licenses in the specific disease area such as leishmaniasis we would insist on having worldwide uh, rights for research and manufacturing to be able to work with the best potential, the best, um, the, uh, the partners that have the strongest capabilities wherever they may be located, capabilities and expertise. Um, and we would always request a commitment from the, the manufacturer to put the final product available at cost, as I mentioned earlier, plus a minimal margin in all endemic countries, regardless of their level income. Um, and lastly, as I mentioned, non-exclusivity is a, is a fundamental principle of the NDI collaboration, which enables not only the sharing of the, of the research data, but, but also to um, a potential technology transfer if in case uh, there would be sufficient volume for several manufacturers or and, and to potentially uh, further lower the price of the product in case of, again, there would be uh, a sufficient volume to, to, to justify price competition. Um, so logically, given the way we, we manage intellectual property as a tool to, uh, to, uh, to share and support our partnership, patenting is quite exceptional. And this is even this is very clearly stated in the NDI IP policy that patent should constitute an exception rather than the rules. But patent could be sought by the NDI to strengthen the ability of the organization to ensure control over the development process or to negotiate with, par with partners. Uh, so over time, in 20 years, uh, the NDI has indeed made use of this um, of this option uh, on two occasions. The first one was actually is actually the last bullet point in relation to the a synthesis process that had been developed by by DNDI in partnership with with Sanofi, and at that time we thought um, we thought it could be interesting to file uh, to file a patent application with a defensive purpose, essentially to make sure that no third party would patent this, this process in our um, instead instead of, uh, yeah, against our, our willingness and, and to make sure that no third party could um, prevent us from using this process. Um, quite quickly, we realized that in fact, this patent was, uh, was not useful for the NDI. And so we assigned the patent application to Sanofi uh, in 2015, and, but the NDI always kept uh, negotiated at the same time uh, a license, a worldwide non-exclusive license to ensure that we could also, uh, that we maintain the ability to, to use this process ourselves in case we would no longer be working with Sanofi. Another interesting case was uh, in the case of a compound that is in, uh, included in the NDI portfolio for Leishman Isis today. Um, so this compound was developed um, by the NDI internally. And in the case of Leishmaniasis, we have realized that patents could also be used as a defensive strategy to, again, to ensure, to protect the compound we, we, uh, we generate and to make sure that no third party would actually, um, would not use um, the, research, uh, the, the research generated by the NDI uh, in a way that could be detrimental to our own research. 
In the case of leishmaniasis, the reason for, for this, the rationale behind this is the fact that leishmaniasis is, um, is affecting not only, not only uh, humans, but also dogs. And in fact, dogs are the reservoir of the, of the parasite. Uh, um, and so there was a there was a, there is a risk that uh, in some countries where uh, leishmaniasis is quite spread uh, amongst dogs, in particular in the in the Mediterranean uh, in countries along the Mediterranean uh, region in, in in southern Europe or in Brazil, there is a risk that if the if the same drug is used. Uh, to treat dogs and to treat humans, this could generate resistance. And the World Health Organization itself advised that the that different drugs should be used to treat dogs or to treat leishmaniasis to to avoid the development of resistance. So that's one of the reasons why the NDI decided to file uh, to file a patent on this compound. It was to be able to control the use that could be made. Um, in the treatment uh, with this compound uh, for in case of treatment of dogs. And we would want to be able to make sure that that no, no resistance is generated uh, through the treatment of dogs with this compound. There has been a few occasions where the NDI has, um, has agreed to uh, limited and control exclusivity in partnership with, uh, uh, in partnerships. Uh, again, this has been very exceptional, like patents. The, the reason for uh, the NDI agreeing to such exclusivities has been um, to provide a time-limited three to five years market entry advantage to a partner that would have made a significant investment in the infrastructure, infrastructure or equipment necessary to, uh, to develop or to manufacture the, the medicine in question. Um, or to provide the assurance to um, to the partner that the NDI would not work in parallel with third parties while development is ongoing, um, or in case uh, the partner would want to use the product for other indication outside uh, neglected disease or, or for animal health. However, again, we would always systematically balance um, this... Uh, this controlled exclusive this exclusivity with uh, an obligation of the partner to ensure equitable and affordable access to the treatment and if such obligation would not be met the ndi would always make sure to keep in its agreement the possibility of the exclusive license becoming again non exclusive in case of abuse of or lack of diligent efforts or or um, um, or in case of breach of, of contract obligation by the partner. Lastly, um, the, the NDI would always, always make sure in its agreement that, uh, that, that the, the, the licensing rights would survive uh, any expiration, the expiration or any early termination of, of the collaboration. Um, this could happen in the case the in case the partner the priorities of the partner change or in case or if the partner is not able to meet uh, its obligation or underperforms and in that case uh, GNDI and the partner this is always both sides uh, would we 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 would have termination provision to make sure that that the licensing rights uh, survive any any such uh, termination. And that uh, the license, the rights uh, ensure the full freedom uh, to operate to the NDI, so that the NDI could identify another partner and um, and continue the development uh, of the project that has that was started. And uh, and so this would also entail um, an undertaking from the from the partner that uh, any technology uh, developed so far would be shared, that all necessary doc documentation would be made available, as well as any approval or and even any stock of um, of API uh, raw material or or the product itself. So to to finish, I wanted to highlight a few case studies. Um, the first one is a product that was developed by the NDI for the treatment of hepatitis C, which is uh, affecting over 50 million people 
uh, globally, and unfortunately, only 20% have access to uh, to uh, an e a safe and effective treatment. So, about uh, back in 2016, the NDI started the development of Ravitasvir, and um, and Ravitasvir was registered uh, in 2021. And here, I want to to show you the the how the partnership was uh, was. Um, uh, yeah, the, the structure of the partnership and, and show how different different partners have, have a role to play. So you can see that the NDI was in the middle. Uh, the NDI was actually uh, granted um, licensing rights from Presidio, which was uh, which is the the owner, the patent owner of, of this uh, molecule Ravitasvia, which was a completely new new um, chemical entity. And the NDI uh, developed Ravitasvir in collaboration with FACO, which is a, 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 an Egyptian company. FACO also got, got the necessary rights from Presidio. But then the, the NDI and FACO uh, partnered with the, Malaysia, with the governments of Malaysia and Thailand that played a major role in the, in the, in the setting up and the management of the phase two, three clinical studies that demonstrated the safety and effectiveness of Ravitasvir for the treatment of, of hepatitis C in combination with another molecule that is called sofosbuvir. Um, however, very from the very early in the in the negotiate in the discussion, it was very clear to all the partners, FACO, Presidio, the government of Malaysia and Thailand that that uh, this treatment would have to be uh, to be available to to all the patients that uh, in need um, of treatment of RHCV, and so we were very clearly targeting uh, countries that were excluded from access uh, from other uh, from other antivirals, and a major objective was to price this product as close as possible to a generic from the start. Given that um, many of the of the development, and in particular the most expensive phase two, three clinical studies, had been funded and uh, generated by by the NDI in collaboration with Malaysia and Thailand, and with support from Med Médecins Sans Frontières, we were able to uh, and FACO generously offered to price the, this product uh, as close as possible to the production cost. And so the price has been. Uh, there was very very early on a, a target price of three to around three to five hundred uh, US dollar for a full treatment, which price could uh, come down with with an increase in volume. Similarly, there was from the start a commitment from FACO to uh, non exclusive sub licensing of the technology with uh, with uh, some possible technology transfer uh, if needed to other companies and we currently have other collaboration ongoing with um, with the uh, pharma uh, pharmaceutical company in Malaysia Pharmaniaga that has been the first market authorization holder of the of the of the medicine but we also have uh, signed recently an agreement with the University of Mahido that uh, is keen to do it was keen to in license the product and uh, and and get a technology transfer to uh, to um, to to manufacture it and and uh, commercialize it in Thailand and we also have um, ongoing partnership with um, with LA, the pharmaceutical company Elea in Argentina where the 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 product is under registration at the moment, and we just started the collaboration last summer with Pharmaginios, the government-owned pharmaceutical company in Brazil. A second critical partnership that, uh, that I wanted to, uh, to highlight today is uh, related to the elimination of sleeping sickness, where DNDA has been working uh, with uh, a a whole set of global health partners, including the national programs and ministries of health of countries affected by sleeping sickness, uh, Sanofi, the French pharmaceutical company, the World Health at the World Health Organization, to develop a series of treatments over the past twenty years to uh, that would each contribute to the, the the elimination of the disease. Sleeping sickness is one of the most neglected diseases in the world. 
uh, with, with around uh, 3 million people at high risk of being infected. But um, until 50 years, 15 years ago, the only tr treatment available was melasopro uh, treatment um, that was very tox toxic based on, uh, on arsenic. And so, and so this treatment was, um, was uh, provided by Sanofi and the NDI entered into uh, collaboration with Sanofi that is still ongoing today, 20 years later, to uh, develop new safe and effective treatment that would, uh, that would help eliminate these deadly diseases. And so a major achievement was in 2018 when the NDI uh, obtained the, the approval of Flexindazole. It was the first new chemical entity that the NDI had developed. Uh, in partnership with Sanofi, Flexindazole uh, was a normal molecule that so that there was no, no patent was filed for, for this compound. We were in this case very much in the case of, uh, of a public good approach that was agreed together with, with Sanofi where there was no need to, to file any, any IP rights. Uh, and Sanofi is providing the is providing the, the compound to all the uh, all the countries where um, all the, ende the the endemic countries were of uh, sleeping sickness um, on the basis of a donation through the World, the World Health Organization. Um, Fexindazole was also um, approved just last year for another indication um, of um, a different strain of the disease. Um, and, and so we'll be able to, to treat this as, a, this, as a, this as a strain of the disease. And lastly, the end goal is also with Sanofi to continue the development of Acoziborol, which would be um, here again, uh, an even more innovative treatment for to sustain elimination of, uh, of this disease because it would be a single dose as compared to Fexindazole, which, is, which has to be taken for 10 days and the NDI is, is very much hoping to, to deliver this, this new treatment in the, in the coming years. So just to conclude, um, I'm, here, I'm giving here the, the reference of this, this publication where we, we provide a lot more details on the, the development, uh, on the, the partnerships and the negotiation we, the NDI has, has signed with uh, over the past 20 years. Uh, and this, this, to this publication, and, and in conclusion, again, we I think what we want to st to stress is that it's with the with the support of of donors that have um, that have provide given the the tools and the, and the resources to the NDI to achieve its mission. We have been able to to agree on partnership based on a, on a very common and shared understanding of patient needs and uh, a shared shared objective with different partners that uh, the most important is to ensure that the treatment will be developed and made available with the two patients. Um, and so the NDI collaboration and licensing agreement uh, always make sure that the IP generated would be uh, made available in the public domain and remain available to, to the NDI, but is shared also with any, any um, any stakeholder willing to contribute to uh, to uh, to the to the treatment of neglected disease. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Pascal. Uh, maybe we can take a few questions out here. Can I start first while uh, other questions are uh, coming in? Uh, just to understand a little bit about how uh, the NDI. Uh, works uh, before we get into the questions. Um, the the uh, on one side you will have organizations from whom you are sourcing inventions or you know uh, molecules which are available, and on the other side you have large companies who could manufacture it or um, you know produce it and sell it. And in between you probably have service partners or partners who can help you develop it and co-develop it, right? Now, the funding uh, that comes uh, for this activity, um, does it come, uh, uh, I mean, first, just to understand a little bit, does it come with any IP-related clauses to DNDI? And second, uh, when you're sourcing it from uh, some of these partners, these molecules, uh, do these, uh, what is, 
the what is the uh, let's say uh, motivation behind some of these people who are developing these uh, molecules and what do they expect uh, what is their motivation behind even coming up with those ideas which can then be taken ahead by the NDA should I start yes please uh, if you... so if I understand clearly uh... I just want to repeat the question to make sure I understood yeah. them clearly. So the, what, the first one is whether there was any IP condition imposed by the donors yeah. of the NBI, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and the second is what is the motivation of the of the the companies that provide compound to the NBI? Yeah. And yeah. are they always companies or they could be academic institutions also? Yeah. Please go ahead. Okay. So um, so donors increasingly. Um, attach condition to their funding to the NDI and, and in particular to the fact that uh, to the, the two um, fundamental principles of the NDI, um, the NDI mission, which is to, to ensure affordable and equitable access. This is more and more uh, included in the, in the policies of, of global health donor funding. And there is also very much, most, most donors, global health donors would also have a global access um, principles in terms of making sure that the research data and research, research tools generated through their funding uh, is made available to the wider research community. So that's rather easy for the NGI to implement those conditions because this, this is also the, the way we work. Um, in terms of the motivation of uh, stakeholders that uh, provide uh, molecules or, or other types of technologies to the NDI, this can be academia or uh, companies, of course, uh, or even um, even um, yeah. In, in we also have um, collaborations with with. Uh, Ah, sorry, I'm looking for my word. CDMOs or, or mm -hmm. contract research organization. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the motivation would very much depend on the nature of the organization. In the case of, um, of commercial companies or big pharmaceutical companies, they would have, there can be various reasons why they would partner with DNDI. In the case of Sanofi, for example, it was it was because they have historically been involved in the in the treatment and the fight against the elimination of the disease. So they had a genuine interest in being a major contributor contributor to this mm -hmm. to this uh, strategy. Um, in the case of uh, the other example I provided about hepatitis C. Mm -hmm. The patent holder of Ravitasvir Presidio uh, was actually had developed this compound up to phase two, but was unable to find um, other partners to for the later development of the, of the pro of the product. Mm -hmm. They were probably a little late in the in the launch of their and the development of their compound, and so they they of generously offered it uh, free of charge to the NDI because mm -hmm. they thought in that case it could benefit uh, low and middle income countries. They had kept rights though to uh, potentially sell it and market it in high income countries. Mm -hmm. And so that's what they were getting from the collaboration. We were mm -hmm. freely finishing the development of the, of the, of the molecule and, um, and they could potentially then market it and get some revenues uh, in high income countries. Okay, uh, I'll just continue. There's a question there uh, on financing. Um, if it uh, question from Sanjay, which says, if it costs a for for profit pharma company hundred million dollars to develop and bring it to market a drug in say the India model is fifty percent more efficient, or uh, say fifty million, where does the fifty million come from? Is it via in kind contributions of ten partners at Five million each, or is it sponsored by a philanthropic and or government entity? Mm. Kavita, do you want to, to also answer this one? Sure. And I can add if need. I can add as sure. well. So, uh, okay, uh, uh, Pascal, I'm sure I'll need your uh, some input there. But sure. um, so one thing is, I would say, uh, not uh, it's not the same thumb rule for every product. It's very different from. Uh, each product has its own journey, its own path. 
the money which if you know if you remember uh, i had mentioned in the beginning that we are one organization who does not have its own uh, you know huge capex and opex mm -hmm. right so and we we said we do not recreate uh, infrastructure capacities ecosystems uh, partners so much of it i would say is the savior because uh, you are partnering with existing institutes and if it's a short term partnership you know there is no uh, overlay of uh, expenses which will continue even after the partnership is over so mm -hmm. that somewhere cut costs and the uh, other is of course we do try to work with lot of cdmos uh, in our part of the world so you mm -hmm. would see we partner with lot of cdmos rather than european cdmos we have lot of um, contract manufacturers or our cros in india uh, and the region um, we try to do a lot of phase ones in out of malaysia um, instead of europe so like i also said it is not cutting corners in drug development but it is finding mechanisms of um uh, and of course you know when the government pays there is de-risking of development so that de-risking money which we all know pharma companies would be costing much more if they do it themselves mm -hmm. versus a de-risk pattern which is done by the uh, the donors money which dndi receives mm -hmm. so those are the some of the you know possible um, mechanisms which allow us to do a little um, i would say affordable drug development and you also pointed out that there was a lot of in-kind contributions in some of in one of your slides. So I presume uh, that means that there are projects which are being defined where you put in some catalytic resources and the organization puts in its own efforts and uh, or the government supports it locally or something like that. Is that so? Uh, yes, Premna, that's a very uh, very valid uh, you know uh, output you have extracted from the talk. I, I mean, I made uh, a couple of slides. Uh, in kind is a huge thing, but what we also do now is we try to uh, so that everybody you know it's not washed under the carpet. We do try to give some numbers from those partners who do in kind contribution, but usually those partners are so uh, benevolent, you know, they don't really do the way a CRO will do their costing. But at least we have some numbers so that uh, we can give a figure value to that in kind contribution. So if you see our annual reports, we do try to quantify the in kind contribution also. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there's a question in also. Case showing, if yeah, I please, may please just add, yeah. um, about five years ago, DNDI released some figures on the cost uh, on its cost of development so far, mm -hmm. and I think those figures are being updated today. So please, uh, you should expect some new figures. But in the first years, um, it was in the in the first fifteen years of DNDI operation. I think the 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 cost DNDI estimated the cost of development uh, to around less than 200, uh, 200 million for the development of a new chemical entities and around thirty to forty million for improved um, improved uh, formulation, and this was taking into account um, the 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 cost of failures. As as uh, as much as as pharmaceutical companies uh, do, uh, the figures also showed that it was estimated that when there was about twelve percent, I think, of in kind contribution from from partners in this uh, in in this all in these whole figures. You can you can you have the details mm -hmm. of the of the of this study on the website. Sure, uh, we'll and, definitely and look it up. Um, the, I'll just take one more question before I go to the IP questions. Um, are the pricing tailored uh, to different markets? Is a question from Roshan. Uh, I think uh, you mentioned somewhere that you have a clause where you ask people not to. Uh, I mean, the pricing is same across markets, irrespective of aff affordability. At least where in endemic countries, right? But in others, probably there is some relaxation. Please comment. So, uh, in the case of neglected disease. Um, I think most of our, um, if I'm thinking of, yeah, different agreement for different treatment for neglected disease, we don't very much do any price difference because in fact, these are neglected patients wherever they may be located. Even in Brazil, if you take uh, where Chagas, for example, is, is a neglected disease, patients affected by Chagas are neglected in, in Brazil. And so we... We, there is no, no real justification for having a different pricing. However, in the case of um, hepatitis C, here we have, we have applied a different uh, pricing strategy. 
because the, the patent owner that gave the NDI uh, free licensing rights um, ask for returns on, in, on, on its own initial investment. And so they uh, we negotiated some scaled, ro um, um, scaled royalties, tiered royalties, if you want, where mm -hmm. uh, the royalty rate was, uh, there was no, it was royalty free for low income countries, but for, for some middle income countries, uh, we agreed to a royalty on sales of Four or seven percent, mm -hmm. depending on the on the gross uh, national income of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, only in countries where the company would have filed and obtained a patent. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a question about also IP strategy. Um, there's a question which asks uh, why is uh, even for defensive uh, strategy. Uh, would uh, just a strategy of not filing a patent at all and just publishing it in a journal or something would be good enough? Or why did you choose to file a patent in one of the cases you mentioned? Uh, is it relating to future IP issues you had anticipated? Or is there any comment you would like to make on that? That's a very good question. That's exactly the question we asked before considering this, uh, this filing, in fact. Um, so in the case of the... The first example that I mentioned, which was related to a process, uh, indeed, it wasn't. Um, it was not possible to provide enough detail in the publication on the manu on the on the on the manufacturing process, and so mm -hmm. we thought, in fact, filing a patent was a one way to actually get the process uh, published, and uh, and that's why uh, only after two years after. Having filed the, the application, the, ND, the NDI was ready to abandon it. But mm -hmm. before abandoning it, we we, we thought that we could uh, offer offer it to to our partners and Ophi, given they were involved in the in the development in the in the development of the treatment, and that could be could have been useful to them. But again, we made sure to keep some non-exclusive rights for the NDI, so that we could. Um, Use, uh, use, make use of this process if need be, or share it with other partners. So, uh, in the second case, here the publication would not, um, you know, in the case of uh, the second case is a very is a very particular one because we have found that in fact it's only patent rights that would enable us to stop any. A, a veterinary company from actually using the the treat the, mm -hmm. the molecule in the treatment of dog and then generate drug resistance. Mm -hmm. If the a publication would yes would prevent a third party from filing patent, mm -hmm. but would not prevent a third party from commercializing the the compound in the veterinary veterinary field, because there may be some uh, interesting revenues in this field and then generating resistance. Mm -hmm. Sure. And also, um, uh, have there been any cases where, for example, you have a molecule uh, which is for a neglected disease, but then a new use case is found for the same molecule, which is a lot more lucrative? How would so you deal with that? So this hasn't happened. Um, most of the time, we don't have rights in, uh, in other lucrative fields. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, in our agreement, we we negotiate rights. We make sure that we have the right to do R and D on neglected disease. And in fact, if if uh, if a partner finds another useful use uh, of the co of the molecule in uh, in another field, we the NDI would not necessarily have rights. Mm -hmm. uh, we would, however, uh, make sure to get compensated mm -hmm. from any. Uh, you know, in case the partner would would uh, would make huge revenues uh, mm -hmm. based on research undertaken at the NDA, we would ask for a fair compensation, mm -hmm. and we would. Now we are more and more include trying to include any to include some um, some provision to again ensure that any DNDA research that contributes to the development of a product. Um, such end product should be available some way 
uh, to uh, and affordable for the population that need it. We wouldn't want the NDI to have contributed to some uh, abusive use of IP, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, another IP related uh, uh, question is about, uh, do you have set of terms and conditions for reposition drugs? And uh, when the drugs are tested for efficacy, who owns the data and does the data enjoy data exclusivity? This is a question from Vidya, Shri Vidya. Mm -hmm. So, as I mentioned, we would, in general, it's the, the, the entity that owns the data is the entity that has developed the data and, pay, and funded it, paid for it. So if the NDI is the one that has uh, generated this data, we would own the data. Uh, but again, we would share it uh, on a non-exclusive basis with with our partners and and uh, and other interested parties. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, as a as a principle, we would not um, aim to have any data exclusivity. No, we mm -hmm. we rather aim to non-exclusivity of the data. Yep. Uh, there's. Uh... I, I don't want to take too much of your time, but there are just a couple more questions. If you don't mind, I'll take it up. Sure. Uh, how do you see the role of Indian startups in the mission of DNDI? What are the role, various touch points? How can their involvement be financially sustainable to the startups? That's one question from Sanjay. Uh, but while you're at it, I'll request Kavita to also speak about, I was about which are, to which say, are yeah, the great organizations <laughs> <laughs> which are participating today from India. Okay, um, so it would be uh, actually we were doing some um, introspection and extrospection. Both are we have you know we are in the middle of uh, we are having a strategic plan which runs from twenty one to twenty eight, and we're exactly in the middle. And uh, we were saying, what is it we are missing out, you know, in the world, or what is it we are not doing right? Do we need to change course? And one of the points which came out very strongly by when we spoke to lots of external stakeholders are that they are such wonderful young biotech companies because you know the technology has changed evolved so much post covid so should we be uh, we are missing out on that you know that was an indication or to us uh, as an organization uh, i i may not have an exact answer how especially the answer which with question which says involvement be financially sustainable to the startup because we certainly don't want a startup to be uh, you know saddled with an ip with a molecule which is not patentable they don't have rights to make profit on that um, so let's let's look at it uh, Premrath, i i really don't yeah. because the second question is really tough how do you ensure because we we understand the needs of a startup to be financially viable otherwise how do they go forward yeah. Like, Sometimes uh, I think uh, uh, tools uh, that they develop, uh, they can make available uh, exactly. for some of the neglected diseases as well. And that exactly. uh, same tools, uh, you know, the, sometimes demonstrating it for a neglected disease creates a lot of credibility for a particular tool. And that tool then can go on to be used for many other diseases as well. So I thought that may right. be one yeah, such no, very situation. Good point. Very yeah, good one point. such fact, situation. Like it is AI companies nowadays. Yeah. I think we are partnering with some AI companies to test, you know, to uh, give them that opportunity also to test their platforms by testing our drugs. But of course, it's in a very, it's a totally pro bono. It gives them a mechanism to test their platform, gives us data from this uh, new tool. Yeah. Uh, Pascal, I, wanted, I saw Pascal wanted to answer yeah. something here. No, 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 yeah. no I, I, I'm not sure. I don't have anything to add. I, I very much agree with everything you said. Yeah, and uh, are you also entering into some of these therapies which are not necessarily small molecules? Are you looking at uh, CGTs, you know, and so on and so forth, gen gene therapy, um, cell therapies, um, mRNA-related ones? Because there are many such domains where they're not going to be accessible to uh, a lot of uh, people for a long time. Plus, um, those are domains also where, um, you know, certain the population, say, for example, that needs sickle cell therapy might be a lot more in some of the underdeveloped countries, right? And uh, that yeah. may or may not be available. Is that something DNDI is looking into? And if so, then startups may have a role there as well. Yeah, true. So, yes, Premnath, like you said, I, you know, we're just saying we realize that in a middle, mid course of our, of our life, that... Uh, Nowadays, the technology platforms are just too many. And you're absolutely right when you say they would not be available for this population if efforts are not made. So uh, maybe we're not jumping immediately to the cell therapy and gene therapy, but certainly uh, we do a lot of uh, you know 
inputs of monoclonal antibodies for infectious diseases because you would have seen our area uh, till now majorly has been neglected diseases which have been tropical though we don't say we limit ourselves to that but uh, maps is something Pimna, uh, for infectious disease and a portable map also we know with that caveat of uh, using the newer mechanisms of making it manufacturing methods is something we've just recently started exploring and rabies is one of the disease which has got us very interested in that um, mm -hmm. area because that's a disease which does not have any treatment not at all it's like it's like a death warrant the moment you, you are diagnosed with it mm -hmm. so and the other thing that is what i wanted to say but yeah you are right these are the some areas which we are looking at and maybe we will start Within a few months, we'll start publishing our uh, our own learnings of where we have fallen short. Mm -hmm. I remember you asked me one more question, Pimnath, on which are the sort of uh, companies and the organizations in yeah. India we work with. Yes, please. We work with quite a few. So ICMR has been naturally our uh, founding partner. ICMR's DG, uh, Director General, sits, uh, sits out of a governing board. He's one of the main members of the governing board and it's ex officio. Uh, we do, uh, so we work with some ICMR institutes, like we work very closely with RMRI, because all the leishmania studies, clinical trials we've done in the state of Bihar. We work with very closely with the DBT Institute, THSTI, for our influenza and our uh, uh, dengue projects. We work uh, for our discovery consortium. We work with um, CDRI. We work with IIT Gandhinagar. We work with NMMIS. Um, so these are immediately I could you know, rattle. Uh, otherwise, of course, lots of pharma companies. We are working with Beatrice. We're working with Cipla, trying to work with Dr. Reddy's. Um, so... Mm. And of course, lots of CDMOs for sure. Sure. Uh, there's a feedback form link which my colleagues have put online. I would request people to fill it up before uh, we close. Uh, let me just take one final question. Uh, there's a question which uh, asking about uh, what are the kind of uh, modeling in silico tools that you use and if there are any collaborations relating to that uh, in some of your drug discovery efforts. This is a question which... Uh, sort of came from, I mean, the name, I don't know, but, uh, um, you know, maybe you can uh, point to any efforts in that direction. You did mention AI, but maybe there are some other uh, in silico studies also that are being done. Pascal, are you aware? I mean, I uh, know. Can I you get back to you, I would love to get back on that question. I have copied sure. that question. Yeah. And I'll check with the discovery uh, le uh, head in the team. Yeah, sure. I think... Uh, uh, we have covered a lot of ground, but I before we close, oh, I just wanted I to. I think we. Yeah. I, yeah. I just we have one colleague online, which I think Anita, uh, okay. which I think had just sent me a message that uh, she may actually have a response to this question. Please do, Anita. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you just one minute? Let me just see. Um, Anita, just if you're, I think you yeah, should be. You're I think muted. I'm unmuted and, now. Yes. Great, great. Please, yeah, please yeah, yeah. Uh, do give us an answer yeah. to that question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, we had, um, you know, Pascal mentioned previously the Discovery Booster, and that was kind of a collaboration of uh, various pharmaceutical companies. And uh, it was a consortium where um, our scientists identified a few structures then went out to the different companies and say, look at it, you know, in silico, which of the, the compounds could, uh, could work and are similar, and then send it to us. And we started to test them all. And then kind of, there were several iterations only, you know, through in silico and we did the testing. And that kind of, uh, um, over a few years, we, did, we uh, you know, could include a series of um, uh, compounds into uh, Leishmaniasis uh, uh, development. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that was kind of a much faster way of identifying a compound. So we do that as well. Mm -hmm. um, currently we're working uh, on, on the compounds we identified and uh, it may be kind of uptaken again, but uh, we do that as well. And uh, I think it will probably be more and more also in combination with AI, an opportunity to, to discover uh, through um, in silico work. Great, thank you. There are quite a few organizations working on this in India, so I'm sure they'll find ways to partner you as well. Uh, one last question to you, uh, Pascal, which is, uh, what should be the pro-access policy for a not-so-neglected disease? Especially when you look at um, uh, a very large disparity in uh, uh, in uh, say affordability, uh, although it's not a neglected disease, but quite uh, you know prevalent in uh, many parts of the world. I think the um, 
this should very much be based on transparency of the of the R and D cost and mm -hmm. the investment mm -hmm. and uh, and the contribution of of public funding or philanthropic mm -hmm. funding, if any, mm -hmm. and um, and reasonable margins by the by the manufacturer and other developer. I think where we see huge access disparities and and uh, and inequities is is most of the time where there has there is an abuse uh, of uh, of um, of some uh, an abusive use of ip many very often and uh, and and very often non, unrelated to the to the 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 R and the the R and D cost and and uh, a reasonable return on investment and and with more transparency on the R and D cost mm -hmm. and on uh, on the the investment this may also be a way to if needed um, encourage uh, governments to uh, to increase their funding to to research and development for the benefit of access down the line. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you also support the efforts of the medicines patent pool uh, where in some of these uh, kind of models? Absolutely. Uh, even though this is just the beginning of, of, uh, of the story, um, mm -hmm. I think the medicines patent pool has shown that, uh, that in some case, um, licensing can be a way to increase access. Um, mm -hmm. The limitation of the model today is the fact that some, some countries are excluded from those deals. Mm -hmm. And the fact that those deals uh, are not not yet a common policy by pharmaceutical companies. There are mm -hmm. too often too many companies that still continue to 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 market their product based on uh, on um, exclusive positioning and, and monopolies and and overpricing. Okay, thank you very much. I think on that note uh, we will close. I'll hand it over back uh, to Vidula and uh, is uh, and i'll request her to close yeah. Yeah. yes sir yeah so thank you everyone it was a very good session and i think something very new that we came to learn today from this topic so thanks pascal thanks dr kavita for joining us and taking up the session thanks to all the participants also thank you sir thank, thank you, you. Again to all. really thank enjoyed you. the session yes thank, thank you thank you very, very much thanks, very interesting. bye bye have a good day. Yeah.